Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second colloquium uh, program of the semester. Last week, we were uh, through the film uh, An Encounter in Boston. We were allowed to share in some of the planning challenges that communities of color faced in Boston and the broader issues around a group of women who were seeking uh, access to land, to food, to, um, to respect, to self-control of their lives. And um, it provoked a wonderful conversation around the role of planning and agencies um, and power. And today, um, our speaker, in a way, is going to bring it um, some of those lessons home by looking at intersectionality and how we engage as planners around these issues and ar around our own identities. Um, Tamika Butler, who uh, has her own consulting firm, is a lawyer and involved in planning policy. And um, we can get a brief sense of who she is by just looking at the list of organizations with which she's had a significant relationship. Um, of course, the rest of her bio is on the uh, website and the notice for this meeting. But she's worked for with tool design, uh, transportation planners, the Los Angeles Neighborhood Land Trust, the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition, the Legal Aid Society, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, the Lambda Literary Foundation, and many other organizations. She received a law degree from Stanford and has degrees as well in psychology and sociology. Um, so with that, I'd like to, um, to welcome to Cornell, Tamika Butler. Thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, good to, to see a few faces and in, in even more boxes. If while I'm talking, things pop up, feel free to throw them in the chat, whether or not it's, oh, I'm, you know, I totally agree or wait, say more about that. Um, when, when you do these virtual engagements, having an active chat is extremely helpful. Um, and so just uh, to get that started off so that I know that there's, you know, some, some warm bodies in the room. Um, and because right now, even though it's only nine in the morning here in LA, all I can think about is dessert. If folks could just introduce themselves to me in the chat with, um, if you can only have one dessert for the rest of your life, what would it be? And that will just help me um, know that there's there's folks here uh, and, and, and folks paying attention. Uh, thanks for getting us started, John. I appreciate it. Oh man, cheesecake is my least favorite, but I respect that, Michael. It's also my wife's favorite. Yes, rice pudding is a good one. Um, New York cheesecake, very particular. Mango sticky rice, under um, underestimated often, but so so good. Peanut M and M's, the only type of M and M's people should eat. I I appreciate uh, cookie dough not cooked. I'm there with you. <laughs> Hannah sushi for dessert. Sushi all the time. I love it. Uh, I grew up in Japan, and so sushi is my comfort food, and I would eat it all the time. Um, a puff puff. I would like to try a puff puff. So thanks for chiming in. And again, the, the more active the chat, uh, the better for me. I will go ahead and share my slides and we will get started. I'll talk for about 45 minutes uh, to an hour and hope that we have plenty of time for a robust Q&A. All right, OK, 
Can I get a thumbs up if folks can see this? Great. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, intersectional living and, and intersectional planning as, as a result. Um, it's, it's something that I know intimately as a person who lives at many intersections um, and something that I've brought into my work. And so when, whenever I, I give these talks, I like to tell you what I'm gonna tell you before I tell you. Um, so I like talking about myself. I'll talk a little bit about myself and, and what I do. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about racism and why it matters. And you know, I, I hold many intersectional identities and often I'll talk about the experience um, as a black woman um, and not necessarily because those are my only identities. But I think when we can start to get more comfortable talking about race, if we can tackle racism, we can tackle a lot of the other isms. I also just happen to think that when we look at disparities in society along any lines, race is still a determining factor um, far more than it should be. Um, and so as I inhabit a, a Black body, I talk about a lot of things um, from the Black experience. But so much of, of what I talk about um, could, could be echoed um, by by your colleagues who identify as, as diverse in, in any way. Um, and so that's, you know, that's something to always, always keep in mind that even though I'm talking about these things from my experience, many folks who have been part of um, historically and continually oppressed groups um, share, share these experiences. Um, so with that, um, let's get started. Let me tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, you, you heard my bio a little bit, um, but one of the things that is most important to me, maybe my most important identity, um, is that I'm from Nebraska. Um, a lot of folks don't know a ton about Nebraska uh, or have only driven through or, or flown over uh, the, the state, but just know that Nebraska is, is a state where we, we have a good life. Um, for folks who wanna learn more about Nebraska, they often Google it and they learn that in fact, yes, uh, Nebraska is a place with a lot of corn. Um, but lucky for us in, in recent months, um, we've become known for, for other things. We've become known as a place where people may in fact um, freeze on the, the runway. And we've also been known in, in an election that is very close as having this small little uh, weird district because of the way our electoral votes are counted um, that could have a huge impact uh, on the election. And that little second district is in fact where I grew up. My, my parents, my sister, uh, you know, my friends are, are mixed in uh, to this data somewhere. Uh, and so not that we ever doubted it, but Nebraska matters. When, when I was going to high school and, and um, undergrad in Nebraska, and as I said, I grew up in, in Okinawa, Japan, but I moved back to Nebraska right before high school. Um, my parents met in high school in Nebraska. My dad has 14 brothers and sisters who all live in Nebraska. He grew up in the projects there. Um, so Nebraska is home. But I remember moving back right before um, I started high school and feeling a bit like a fish out of water. And feeling like when we lived overseas, um, my dad was in the Air Force, so much was the same, right? Like our, our parents all had the same jobs. Uh, there was only one store on base. Um, and so we all bought the same clothes from the same place. And I remember moving back uh, to, to Nebraska and, and it was like that book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Like it was stark. I went from a place where my main identifying characteristic was that I was American um, and moved back to a place where it was very clear that my main identifying characteristic was the color of my skin. Um, so much so uh, that uh, the school and teachers tried to convince my parents that they had no honors classes or no uh, AP classes, um, and that I simply um, couldn't, couldn't, you know, couldn't partake in those classes. Uh, I would like all of those administrators to see me now. Uh, I also, you know, had an experience where as I was coming into terms about who I was as a queer person. Um, it just felt like Nebraska was so small. I was in college at a Jesuit school, which was amazing. And I, I got a lot from my Jesuit education, but also being a black kid at a Catholic university in Nebraska, um, 
is it the most liberating experience? And so I remember distinctly saying to myself, I'm too gay and I'm too black. I have to leave the state. And so I ended up um, applying to law schools all over the country. And when you visit uh, Berkeley um, in the Bay Area um, during a winter snowstorm, uh, you immediately decide to cancel all your visits to your East Coast schools in the Bay Area. And so I ended up at Stanford in part because as this queer kid from the Midwest, I thought, I wanna go to the gay Mecca. I wanna go to San Francisco. It is a rude awakening to someone from Nebraska to learn that San Francisco and Palo Alto are very, very different places. Um, and it's also a, a rude awakening to learn uh, that San Francisco might in fact be a gay Mecca for a certain type of gay man but I do not fit that category. Uh, nonetheless, um, I love my academic experience. And after I graduated from law school, I was awarded a, a fellowship, uh, a Skadden fellowship, which is awarded to about 25 folks across the country to do your dream legal job. And my dream legal job was to open up workers' rights clinics in the historically Black and too often neglected communities uh, in San Francisco. Black folks were getting pushed out of the city and there weren't always a ton of resources. And so I wanted to open a one-stop workers' rights clinic. And one of the neighborhoods that I was supposed to open a clinic in was Bayview Hunters Point. A lot of folks who don't know uh, the Bay Area or don't know San Francisco don't know much about Bayview Hunters Point until you tell them that it's where Candlestick Park uh, used, used to be and where the San Francisco 49ers played before they built a big uh, Levi Stadium in, in San Jose. And so as I was going into churches and restaurants and, and trying to talk to community members and say like, hey, I'm here to answer any of your employment law questions to help you um, with unemployment or leave. Like, what do you need? Like, have you been discriminated against at work? All anybody wanted to talk to me about was the new T Muni line. Um, that was servicing Bayview Hunters Point, right? And, and what, what these folks kept saying to me is this isn't for us. This wasn't planned with us. This wasn't planned for us. This was planned for folks who wanna go to the stadium. This was planned for tourists. We weren't given jobs to work on it and no one talked to us about stops or times, right? So in this job where I was supposed to be doing employment law, it was the first time that I was really confronted with the fact that transportation is the prism through which we should be seeing all of our other social justice issues. We can't talk about jobs. We can't talk about healthcare. We can't talk about getting. We can't talk about getting a vaccine if we can't talk about how folks will get there, right? And and for me, it really opened my eyes about transportation. A few years later, where I decided to make the wise decision of being a recovering uh, attorney. Um, I applied for a job at the LA County Bicycle Coalition and I got that job. And that is what opened my mind up uh, to urban planning. Uh, as you heard in my bio, I then moved on to a land trust uh, that built parks and gardens. I served on the board of an affordable housing land trust, serving on the board uh, of transit organization, transit center. I just completely fell in love with the built environment and land use. And I kept asking myself, where has this career been my whole life? How come white people were keeping this secret, right? Planning and the way we shape our built environment and our communities is about keeping folks in and out. Oftentimes when you're young and black and you care about social justice, you get advice, be a civil rights lawyer, work on you know, police reform or criminal justice reform. And no one says, go be a planner go be a, a transportation engineer. And it's insane that they don't because planning and engineering and how we make decisions about our built environment are just more forms of policing bodies, right? And so when I fell in love with this profession, um, you know, I, I wanted to learn more. And so I worked at the Bike Coalition, I worked at the Neighborhood Land Trust, and then we had our first kid uh, and kids, are expensive um, and he doesn't contribute to rent. And so I thought I have to get a job where I could make a little bit more money. And I was fortunate to be hired um, at the great consulting firm Tool Design where I was able to be the director of equity and inclusion for all 17 offices of the firm across the United States and Canada and also be our California planning director and lead our planning work in California, right? And so 
I did that job and then last summer happened. And all of a sudden, all the things that folks of color have been saying became very lucrative. And I decided, you know, we need more support at home to be able to provide childcare. And I could do that by controlling my own schedule, my own billable target. Um, and there's also a lot of work out there for folks who care about transportation equity. I think sometimes people get excited about what's happened in the last year, or they get excited about someone like Secretary Pete talking about equity and all they do, and they forget that whether or not you're talking about Anthony Fox or whether or not you're talking about a local you know, community advocate, folks of color have been doing this work for a long time. It's just that over the past year, folks wanted to start paying us uh, to do it uh, and doing it more. And so I was lucky enough to be able to start my own consulting practice where about 50% of my clients are, are straight up transportation clients. About 40% are a wide range of companies, foundations, museums, nonprofits who are looking to uh, you know, incorporate equity principles into their work and really do change management. And about 10% of my clients are straight up sustainability climate change um, clients. And, and for me, the best part of my job is I get to choose the folks I wanna work for and the things I wanna do. And I get to just constantly be in conversations where I say to people, well, we have to talk about race. And, and again, in the last year, more people are, are open to that conversation. But the question I still get a lot when someone brings me in to talk about a street redesign or the potential of having a bike lane in a community is you keep talking about race, but why does any of this matter? Every time I try to bring up race in planning spaces, I get this look. I get this head scratch and look like Kanye wondering what's going on with his marriage. Like I just, I get a total, you know, surprise. And what I always try to tell people is, Maybe you just started thinking about the way that place and space polices the movements of certain folks of color. But for those of us who, who have lived our whole lives um, knowing this, it's because as a black person, from the second my ancestors were enslaved and put on a ship and brought here, asked to build this country on our backs, we've been keenly aware of the way that our movement and public space is always an issue, right? We've grown up with reminders of where we could go and not go. We've grown up on the outside looking in, wondering why certain communities have access to resources like parks and green space and our communities don't. When you think about the very foundation of this country, this country was built on white supremacy. This country was built upon the idea that we can steal people and free labor and still land. And that we could try to make people believe that it's just manifest destiny, that it's just hard work and determination and grit. When in fact, it's the hard work of folks we impress and it's the stealing of their resources. We live in a country where someone can write a book that Hitler refers to is like a Bible to him because it talks about the way that folks of color are diluting the human race. And the same author of that book could be regarded highly as one of the forefathers of our national park system. A system that again was predicated on stealing land from indigenous people. I still sit in LA on stolen Tongva land, right? So we have a system that was built on stealing land, putting up fences and charging people to get in. And to this day, the legacy of that continues when you look at the demographics of who uses our national park system. And you see that folks of color use our parks at a lower rate, right? Have less access. Many of us know and have grown up understanding that there's someone, not us, drawing maps with lines and saying where it's okay to be, where it's okay to invest, and what parts of town are just the other side of the tracks, right? We make zoning and land use decisions about what types of things can happen in certain places. And people might like to say that it's about income, but it's not about income. It's often about race. I live adjacent to a community called Baldwin Hills. For folks who don't know Baldwin Hills, think about, you know, it's, it's aging myself a bit, but think about MTV when they had their show, The Hills. 
a lot of white kids love that show. Black kids were watching Baldwin Hills on BET. And Baldwin Hills was about this rich black neighborhood, the likes of Ray Charles building mansions. If you watch Insecure and Issa Ray now, and you see that episode where they're going to these fancy houses in the hills, jumping in people's pools, that's Baldwin Hills. Any episodes where they're having house parties in the hills, that's Baldwin Hills. It is rich black folks rich black folks who also happen to be adjacent and live next to the largest active oil drilling site in this country. And it's not because they're poor, it's because they're black. One of my friends who was born and raised in LA was like, yo, all of my rich black friends from high school, they lived in Baldwin Hills and Ladera Heights. They lived in the Dons. Also, a lot of my friends from high school who were black, suffer from asthma, have already had multiple miscarriages, are dealing with a lot of cancer in their family, right? Not because they're poor. When we think about the kids who have to go outside and play for recess, abutting a major highway or interstate system, breathing in those fumes, thinking about the freight corridors that go through, we all know, or we should know, that highways are some of the largest perpetuators of white supremacy in this country. And they continue to do it today when you look at cities like Houston that are still trying to build these huge systems. Think about when you're driving and what communities say next seven stops, this community, and what communities, if you blink, you miss it. The communities that were deemed okay to raise and dispose of people and homes, and legacies? What are the communities that we continue to intentionally keep sectioned off? The Bayview Hunters points that are cut off from the core of the city and the jobs and the opportunities and only are thought of when other people decide that there's something they wanna get to, right? Where I live in LA, if you think about West LA, where UCLA is, where Beverly Hills is, and you think about South Central, you realize that there are certain communities where folks have more access to fast food than fresh food, more access to liquor stores than grocery stores. And so as a transportation person who does this work, I've shown up at so many meetings where people want to ask me about all these things, grocery stores, the oil drilling, right? And I'm like, well, I'm just here to talk about bike lanes. And too often as transportation minded folks or as the housing person, or whatever it is in our little planning toolbox that we say we're there to talk about, we get there. And when people ask us these questions, we say, well, I'm just the insert person, right? I can't answer those questions. And my great friend and colleague, Charles Brown at Rutgers, he always says, if you are my transportation planner and you show up at a transportation meeting and you can't answer questions about housing or parks, then you can't be on my team. Because we have to start realizing that the communities that we're there to serve, they aren't thinking just about the bike lane or the park or the housing development that we ask them to come to the meeting to talk about. They're thinking about the way all of these things are colliding in their lives. Like one of my heroes, the, the great queer writer Audre Lorde says, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't lead single issue lives. And for whatever reason, we're often not taught to think about our planning work in this intersectional way. Intersectionality may be a term that folks throw around, but do we always understand it, right? Kimberly Crenshaw, who created this term, made it very clear that intersectionality is a framework, and framework is very intentional, not a lens. We like to talk about lenses a lot, but lenses are things you take on and off. She talks about intersectionality being a framework, something that is crucial, that is embedded, that is deep. And it's a way to understand that the multiple aspects of our identities intersect and influence one another, and they compound to create these unique experiences. And it's not just the identities we hold as people, it's the issues we're facing, paying the rent, getting a job, how we get to that job, making sure we have access to healthcare, making sure our kids are okay, making sure we can use the bathrooms that are consistent with our gender identity, making sure that we are being clear about our immigration status and what's where we're able to go and not go as a result. 
right? All of these things come together. Even if you just ask me to come to a meeting to talk about this proposed planning project. And the thing is, for whatever reason, too often, we don't like to do this work in this intersectional way. And we ask the folks who we say we're there to help to just separate this one part of their life and just focus on this one thing. And for many of the people we're trying to serve, it's hard for them because in their mind, their neighborhood is literally killing them, right? As, as someone who does transportation work, when I think about intersections, I think about the fact that that's where all the action happens. If I have a client who comes to me and says, people keep dying at this intersection, can you fix it? I don't get to throw up my hands and say, Oof, this seems hard. We have to talk about signal timing turning radius, lane width. We might have to extend the curb. We might, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. This is gonna be complicated. This is gonna require math. I mean, you know what? Let's just go mid block and build a parklet and call it good. I don't get to do that. But for whatever reason, even though we can intellectually understand that intersections are messy and complicated, but also where we can make a ton of impact, we don't like to think that we should do our work this way. Instead, you say, well, let's talk about intersectionality and racism and people give you a look like, wait, what? Or they say, well, this is profound. How come we've never thought about it like this before? We've just never done this. We're gonna have to think about something new. And when we think about the we-ness of why this is all new, I think we have to ask ourselves, if it's because we're existing in a white space, right? We need to be able to talk about race because frankly, if you can't talk about race, I don't know if I can trust you. If you can't even say it, then how can we address it? How can we tackle it? And when we talk about race and this work, I think about a couple of things. I think about the fact that for planners, white folks are overrepresented, 80% of urban and regional planners are white, 80%. And we know it's the same thing when we think about engineers, right? There's a lot of white men, and then there's a lot of white women, and then there's everybody else. And it just, it doesn't match up. I said I was on the board of transit center and they did the study where we saw that women only comprise 39% of the transit agency workforce. Less than five transit agency CEOs are women. And let's not even talk about the transit agency boards. Contrast that to what we know about ridership on transit, right? It's just two completely different worlds. And then for those of us who, who love planning, right? We keep hearing that technology is gonna be a big part of the future of our profession. Whether or not you're talking about housing, and the ways that things like Redfin and other apps are controlling how we think about it, or whether or not you're talking about my chosen field, transportation. We know that folks think that technology and disruption are the way to the future. But for me, sometimes I'm excited about that, like I care about it, but I also get nervous about it. And I get nervous about it because I'm a black person. I know that the technology that's supposed to make it easier for me to wash my hands during COVID by putting them under an electronic soap dispenser and faucet so that I don't ever have to touch anything never seem to come on for my black skin. They just don't detect me, right? I know the research about the way that autonomous vehicles are less likely to stop for dark skinned people. And I know that technology is also a white space. Let's think about some of those transportation technology companies. When you think about Uber and you think about gender, yeah, there's a lot more men. And a lot of those men are white. And it doesn't get any better when you look at leadership. In fact, it gets worse. The disparities are even higher. And we don't have to just pick on Uber, think about Lyft, the same thing. That big blue bubble, that's white folks. And again, it doesn't get any better when you talk about leadership.
And so we know that planners and engineers and tech folks, there is this disproportion. So when we say, why don't we do the work intersectionally? Well, a lot of the folks doing the work have the privilege where they don't have to live at intersections, so they don't have to think about them. But I'm a person who always thinks our great hope is in the future, right? And so we can think about our educational institutions. And when we think about our educational institutions, we still have to ask ourselves if urban planning has a race problem. Just a few years ago in Houston, urban planning professors from across the country convened. And it was just a few weeks out from the one year anniversary of the civil unrest in Ferguson, right? Following the shooting of Michael Brown. And they discussed the significance of that event. And one of my favorite professors, Lisa Bates from Portland State University had a message. She said, urban planning has a race problem and it's a problem that they don't want to acknowledge, right? And, and it just is, and it's, it's so clear, but what's happening is that we're saying that something is normal when really it's just about who's determined what normal is. We've convinced ourselves that this is just how things work and we've cut ourselves off from having to acknowledge what is unjust. Professor Bates argued that urban planners rarely follow the work of academics in the fields of like African-American studies. Sure, it's separate, but it's related and could provide valuable insights on addressing urban disparities, but not everyone does it. And even, you know, when I think about a place like Cornell, you go to the website, and I love that the first thing I see is women and folks of color, right? It's amazing. But whenever you see these pictures as a person of color, you often wonder if you talk to students of color at any academic institution anywhere, we all have stories of how photographers seem to be able to always find us. But just one scroll later, and when you're struck, with who the faculty is at the school, it feels so different, right? And sure, this is just one page. When you go look at the actual faculty page for Cornell, there is a little bit more diversity, but as you scroll, you still see that it is predominantly men and it is predominantly white men. And so for those of us who care about this space, I just applied to PhD programs, like I want to be in academia or for those of us who wanna work. I did the same thing when I started at firms. Every firm I was interviewing at, I went and looked at the website. And I remember having conversations with white male colleagues who were like, wait, what? People just look for the pictures and literally count? And all the women in the room were like, yes. And all the people of color in the room and the queer folks, the folks with disabilities, we were like, absolutely. We look at who's there, we look how they do their hair, we look how they dress, that tells us so much, right? We know that the folks who are teaching this next generation of planners and engineers and folks who care about place are again, disproportionately white. And so what does that mean when we want to do intersectional work? How does that come up in practice? A great example is this past summer, NACTO, which is a national organization that I know a lot of us have heard of, this association that brings cities together and helps provide insight and feedback about how they can do different things in their city. They started a new initiative called Streets for Pandemic Response and Recovery. And with my colleague and friend, Naomi Iwasaki, we got to work with the 10 cities who were given grants to think about how they can respond to pandemic efforts with things like outdoor dining programs, slow streets programs, and community and mobility hubs, right? And we got to focus on what does community partnership look like when you do this kind of work? And something that we tried to talk about and that it was great to partner with NACTO on elevating was the fact that 
today, when we think about the ways that racism shows up in society, we think about the fact that COVID-19 presented new challenges. But the reality is that systematic racism, anti-Blackness and discrimination have been devastating our society long before 2020. They've always been there. Some might say they were hiding in plain sight. Some might say they weren't hiding. People just weren't listening, right? When you think about transportation, you have to think about civil rights and racism. When you think about our criminal justice system, when you think about environmental justice and people's ability to have residential mobility, when you think about schools and segregation. And for those of us in this space, when we think about something like redlining, right? Race has always been there. But when I talk about whether or not something is a white space, we have to understand that we have to start decentering whiteness in this work. And what do I mean by decentering whiteness? Take The Color of Law, a great book. If you haven't read it, you should read it. I've read it, I've enjoyed it. I've been on panels with the author. It's a great book, right? But the subtitle of this book, this New York Times bestseller, this book that re-entered the New York Times bestselling list last summer when everybody was trying to signal virtue how woke they were and change up what they were reading, the subtitle of this book is A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. That is centering whiteness. Saying that something is forgotten, I have to ask who forgot? Have Japanese Americans forgot about the way they were segregated and interned? Have indigenous people forgot about the way their land was taken and they were segregated onto reservations? I know black folks haven't forgotten about how we've been segregated. I know I haven't forgotten about the lack of generational wealth that my parents have to pass down to me because of that segregation in the history and the government policies. So when we say things like this is forgotten or we've never done anything like this before, or we're gonna have to change our approach or we're gonna have to do things differently. We have to acknowledge that we is centering whiteness because some of us have been doing this, right? When I think about transportation, again, just as an example, but I could extrapolate this across any form of planning. When I think about it, I think about whiteness. And whiteness is this idea that there are processes and practices that are just based on basic rights and values and beliefs and perspectives and experiences, things that we all share but are actually only consistently afforded to white folks, right? And not just that, white, able-bodied, cisgender men who identify as Christian, who have a certain amount of access to wealth. When we engage in planning practices that center whiteness, I think a lot of time our intent is pure and we believe we're planning in a way that includes those basic perspectives and experiences that I was talking about. But we have to start realizing that we're making decisions about policies and and space and planning practices. They're based on experiences of place and space that are only afforded to those who are able to experience those places and spaces and white bodies. And again, I use this NACTO example because this week we celebrated the one year anniversary of Brother Ahmad running in his neighborhood and being shot, being killed, being hunted. A modern day lynching, right? But it's also the one year anniversary of when our profession were tripping over themselves to talk about slow streets. And slow streets and what we helped elevate with NACTO is that slow streets were a direct example of the disconnect that is often manifested despite the best intents in our planning work, right? Sure, it's a great idea. Reduce or prohibit vehicle traffic on residential streets. We have all of our health professionals telling us that with the pandemic, right? And this was at the beginning when people were hitting their first wall. We're like now on wall 37. But when folks were hitting their first wall, we had all of the public health professionals saying, get outside, be active, do it in a socially distanced way. And streets are some of our most valuable resources. And so slow streets programs across the nation aim to repurpose public spaces, recreational areas. But this was done in a vacuum. 
When advocates of color repeatedly spoke up, we were silenced and pushed aside and told we just didn't get it. And all we were trying to say is, it doesn't matter how slow the street is, we're still getting killed. You can't tell me that putting up cones is gonna make me safe, right? And that's the thing about being in white spaces. When you're young, black and gifted or young, gifted and whatever makes you diverse, you realize a couple of things. Harvard Business Review did this whole issue on the fact that black folks are underrepresented in almost every type of industry. And one of the things is when you are diverse, you have to figure out the ways of white folks. You have to figure out how to navigate in these white spaces. You have to figure out how to code switch. When folks are like, what's code switching? I tell people to think back or to Google that image of President Barack Obama going into a locker room to meet basketball players and first going to the white coach and shaking his hand and saying, how are you? And then he gets to a back player and he daps him up and gives him a hug. He didn't even have to think about that, right? But when you're not part of the majority, you're constantly in spaces where you have to learn how to code switch in and out, where we have to realize that there are things that have been deemed as professional, like a handshake, like clocking in and clocking out. But we don't talk about the ways that those norms and practices were established. That clocking in and clocking out has its roots on the plantation with owners trying to control when and how people work. We say it's just professional. We say it's just how you greet each other in a professional setting, but we don't acknowledge who's defining the rules. And when folks have to constantly switch in and out, we have to acknowledge that things like this are seen as crucial for professional advancement, but they come at a great psychological cost. If leaders really wanna promote inclusion and address inequity, they have to start understanding that a segment of our academic institutions, of our student bodies, of our workforces, feel like they can't be themselves. And again, everyone might say, well, that's just professionalism, but we have to realize that for different folks, it feels different. That we know that organizational segregation is persistent. And that for many of us, it feels like whiteness is a key credential for moving up whiteness and maleness and straightness. And again, you don't have to be straight or white or male to perpetuate things. There are many female leaders of color who might have had to advance by fitting a certain mold and they therefore perpetuate these things. And we have to stop narrowing conversations to just be about racial animus or feelings and really understand that there's this larger like baked in system where many folks of color feel like whether or not it's at an academic institution or at a job or working for a city, that in order to be successful, we have to be invisible. Because when we're not invisible, sure, everybody celebrates us when we come in and there's this honeymoon period, look how diverse we are. But at some point, especially when the folks of color who we hire are admit into our programs who are supposed to be there just studying like everybody else, just producing research like everyone else, just working on projects like everyone else. When we also ask them to help solve our racial equity problems, and then they take on that extra work and they start pointing out issues and they start trying to work within the established structure and working groups and task force and mentorship. When they start to do that and ask for accountability, they suffer injury, they suffer microaggressions they suffer defensiveness and denial, and they are often pushed out. They are often retaliated against, or more than not, we start having conversations, well, if we make these accommodations for folks with disabilities, if we change our bathrooms to just be unisex so anyone can use them, if we do these things, we're, we're gonna have to take from somebody else. We start to believe in scarcity. And the thing is that makes it hard as a person who identifies as diverse to figure out where to go and who to trust. Something I always ask people to do is to just take a minute and think about the people you trust most in your professional or academic circles. Just literally take a minute and write it down or think about if you were working on some research, if you were in a class and you were having trouble, if you we're working on a project and you wanted some insight on how to do something differently. 
who would you reach out to? Who would you ask for help and support? Who's in that circle of trust for you? And what folks often realize when they do that, and I hope everybody took a minute to do that. And what folks realize when they do that is that their circle of trust is often folks who are a lot like them. Same race, same religion, from the same country, maybe the same sexual orientation. Maybe you didn't go to the exact same type or the exact same school, but you went to the same types of school, right? And that's because whenever we're trying to do things, often we're like, well, we, we, ha we have to do this quickly because part of white supremacy culture is this false sense of urgency. And when we have to do things quickly or when we think we have to have the best, we just reach out to our networks. And what we end up doing is replicating ourselves. And so when we think about the people we trust, the people we trust are often the people most like us. But what did we learn during the pandemic? That during a pandemic, it was fine to trust people who were different than us. Last year, when fires were ravaging the West Coast, we trusted folks of color to go out and pick the food that would feed the rest of the country. We trusted folks of color to deliver our packages, to check us out at the grocery store. The reality is, if you're a person who looks like me, you know somebody who's had COVID. You've known somebody who's died from COVID, right? I lost one of my dear friends from college, black woman, gone. We know the essential workers. My mom has gone to work every single day. When she shared an office with someone who tested positive for COVID, whose husband tested positive for COVID, she was told to go get a rapid test and come right back, right? My sister's a teacher. She's had to go to work every single day, right? Our communities know that folks trust us when they need us. But then when they do programs like Slow Streets, they also want us to trust that it's in our best interest. But we're also living in a world where we can see somebody like George Floyd gasp for his last breath with the knee on his neck and know that that green bike lane in the background didn't save him. We live in a world where we know walking around our own neighborhood just with a hoodie and eating Skittles or going on a jog could mean we never come home. We live in a world where we know we can get stopped for a bike infraction and lose our lives. I worked at a bike coalition. I know and love and adore a lot of bike bros and I have seen them get stopped by cops and chew them out about how they know more about the law than the cops. And they never have to worry about losing their lives because they're white. And that's not true. We're doing this work in this way where we're supposed to just show up and get on Zoom, go to class, go to work and just keep doing this very important planning work, but absent of the intersections. But we live at intersections. We show up every day in class or at work, just wanting to be our best, wanting our bosses and our professors to value us, to think our work is important and good. We want them to know our names and appreciate our contributions. But sometimes it feels like the only way people will learn our names is if we end up as a hashtag, right? As someone who is living at the intersections of queerness and blackness, who is gender non-conforming, I have to think about the fact that in a year when everyone said, well, this is a turning point, we're talking about race and racism and equity and discrimination more than ever. It also happened to be a year where folks who identified under that big umbrella of trans like me died at a higher rate than ever. But we're just supposed to keep showing up, keep doing the work, keep going to class, keep zooming in, deal with the small talk of like, oh yeah, how are you doing? Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we feel like we're just not okay. 
And I always give a seizure warning on this slide because this is how it literally feels to be someone who is trying to live at the intersections and plan at the intersections. It feels like you're not okay, but it feels like no one cares. So if you care, what are you supposed to do? Well, first I always say, <laughs> stop killing trans people of color, stop killing black people. But also you have to be able to educate yourself. You have to understand that just saying you're not racist isn't the same as being an anti-racist. That being anti-racist requires persistent self-awareness, criticism, and regular self-examination. You have to do this every single day and be conscious about it. We also have to get past this point of thinking that white supremacy is just about people in sheets or people with tiki torches. It's not just this thing we're trying to escape. It's the very water we're swimming in. It is a system a system which sole purpose is to maintain and defend what we currently see as wealth, power, and privilege. And that when people feel their grip loosening on that power, that, that proximity to power, that whiteness, they will do anything to hold on to it, including saying that, you know, that person of color in the program or at the job just is a bad communicator, not a good culture fit. That it's that they just, you know, there's just something off about them. They might even storm the Capitol. We also have to start understanding that if we want to talk about equity, we have to understand power. Too often, power has been viewed as something like a sword that we should wield over others, right? Like, instead, we have to realize that when we say we want to empower communities, that is a colonial mindset. As an individual, I can say that I feel empowered, but I don't need anybody else to say I have the power and it's only me who can bestow it upon you. There you go, you are now empowered. We have to realize that the folks who we say we wanna serve and help, we can't just be saviors. We have to acknowledge and see and hold space for the fact that they have power and we should be co-powering them, not empowering them. How does power work when we talk about equality and equity? People love this picture. And I get it, right? It's a good visual to help you understand that when you just give everybody the same thing, the person who was already able to see can still see and the person who couldn't still might not be able to. Equity means that some people might get something and some people might get nothing. But I hate this picture because it doesn't show the reality of where we're really starting. And it also doesn't show where we should be trying to get. My people have been trying to get free since we were enslaved. I do transportation work because I want people to be able to move with dignity freely to get to the places and people and resources they need and want. I'm not just trying to see over a fence, I'm trying to tear fences down. But even this picture is a little problematic because as I said, we have to understand power. But someone in this picture still had the power to determine that what these folks wanted was to see a baseball game. And that somehow just being able to see it wearing shorts instead of pants is better. But what about self-determination? True liberation comes with those who we say we're trying to help having some self-determination. Do they like baseball? Do they wanna watch baseball? Maybe they wanna play, maybe they wanna coach, maybe they wanna own the team. Real liberation comes with self-determination. And self-determination means that you have to be able to tell somebody when their idea of what they want to do for you, whether or not it's a slow street or watching a baseball game or changing a curriculum, anything that they are trying to do for you without you may have the best intent. But that doesn't mean that the impact is what they hope. And the intent of our actions really matter because the intent you know, might make us feel good, but the impact is what really matters. The impact is what stands to further the, margulation, the marginalization or oppression of those folks around us. We have to start realizing that when it comes to people's lives and identities, the impacts of our actions are far more profound and wide reaching than the intent. And so when people say that to us, we have to take responsibility for it. We have to let down this, this need to be defensive and we need to just take accountability, apologize and move forward. We need to step back and listen to what we're being told about the impact. I don't understand why when 
we're hanging out with friends and they ask you to give them something and you toss it and it hits them and they go, ow, you say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It doesn't matter what you intend it. When it hit them, it hurt. So you say sorry. But when someone says this plan you have for me or this thing you've done or this policy or this program, you meant to just toss it, but you actually threw it and it hit me. Instead, we want to explain what we meant. The impact can hurt and we have to apologize. And if we really want to see institutional change, we have to be brave. Too often we talk about the need for safe spaces when we're doing this work. In case the point hasn't been proven, to live as my full authentic self as a Black genderqueer woman in this country and also in this planning space, this white space, I have to be brave. And so for those of you who have the privilege where just to live every day, you don't have to be brave. You have the privilege of hoping to be safe. The least you can do if you wanna do this work is force yourself to be a little brave. That means not being so scared to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing that you do nothing. You have to get in there, you have to try. And when you fall off that bike, you have to get right back up and keep pedaling. You have to apologize, you have to take accountability and you have to hold space for atonement and acknowledgement of past harm, no matter your intent. Again, if you wanna do equity work, you have to understand power. The easiest way to understand power, it's a quick two-step process. When you have a new program or policy or decision that you're trying to make, ask who's gonna be most impacted. And that's whether or not it's a burden or a benefit. And after you figure out who's gonna be the most impacted, look around at your decision-making table and say, are those folks here? And if they're not here, you know you have a power imbalance. Because there is a difference between diversity, just saying, look at all the diverse faces we have at the table and true inclusion. True inclusion are those diverse folks you brought to the table, they also have some decision-making power. They can control budgets, they can divert resources. It is 2021, inclusion is no longer about everyone feels welcome here. Inclusion is about there has been a sharing and shifting of power. So you have to understand the role that power plays. And then you have to be able to analyze and challenge privilege. Who has the privilege to be listened to? Oh, well, we're listening to the data. Well, who created that data? Who got to interpret that data? Where is data created? Where are the skills learned to put together a data set? Institutions, who gets into those institutions? What barriers are there to those institutions? We constantly have to be analyzing and challenging privilege and not feeling guilty for our privilege, but really challenging it. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll end with this picture of my wife and my son. I always include this picture in my presentations. And if you've heard me speak before, you know, I include it because I feel like it shows a lot about me. It shows the things I love, basketball in the background, green, green space and plants but also my wife and my son, right? My son, Ate, is a black boy. I want him to be full of joy. But we also made a conscious decision not to be those great liberal queers who raise him free of gender and let him tell us who he is. One day he will tell us and we will support him no matter what he says. But that doesn't change that right now as a black boy, it is our responsibility if we wanna keep him alive to tell him that there are things he will never be able to do that as white cousins can do. We've already had conversations, he's two and a half. We've already had conversations in daycare about how he and the one other black kid just have a different energy or just tougher to manage, right? They're just toddlers. I've seen the little white girl with blonde hair stand on the table scream but she's just a toddler whereas my son is different right we have to know that this is something he's gonna face i don't do this work because i'm an expert i do this work because i live in a black body and my life depends on it and at some point when we decided to raise our son as a black man my white wife my french canadian super white wife she had to figure it out. She didn't get to throw up her hands and say, well, you're the black parent, so you got this, right? She had to figure out how to read. She had to figure out how to do black hair. She had to change the places where she took in news. She had to change 
the things she knew to be true because she had to realize that we each had a role to play in raising this black man. And for whatever reason, we don't do that in our academic institutions. We don't do that in our professional settings. When we decide we care about this work, we then look at our folks who are oppressed and we say, you got this, right? Good luck. We'll give you some resources, not enough. Instead, we have to start realizing that if we're gonna do this, we're all in this because my life depends on it. And as we saw during COVID-19, if you're relying on us folks of color to do all the things, then guess what? Your life depends on it too. If we're essential to survival, then we all have to start acting like it. And so for me, the best way I can do intersectional planning work is by being my true authentic self, a person who lives at the intersections. My white wife, who is a woman and also queer, she has to fully live at her intersections. To do this work, when I think about Black aesthetic or queering space, and I think about all these intellectual conversations about it, I also think it's about just being myself. And it's about creating a world where I can be myself, where I can be, where I can have the privilege of saying it's safe. And so as we do this work and as we move forward, we have to realize that true intersectional planning work comes from an acknowledgement that there are intersections and comes from an acknowledgement that we can't just continue to rely on folks who are members of oppressed groups to set themselves on fire to keep the rest of us warm. We all have a role to play in keeping folks warm. And that's the only way that this intersectional work is gonna be done. That's the only way that these white spaces are gonna change. And for some of us, that's the only way we're gonna survive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamika. That was uh, obviously powerful and raising a lot of issues that I think we all want to think about. Um, I find myself wanting to spend a little bit of time just absorbing and, and internalizing a lot of what you've said, even though some of it obviously we've heard before, but the way you put it together is clearly quite powerful. Um, but we have time for questions and, and I'd like to welcome people um, either doing it through chat or just raise a hand um, as a participant and, um, and we can um, go from there. I, um, I think you've got very nice comments obviously from in the chat in response to what you said. Um, okay, good. Um, it's like Thomas. Has Thomas a question. Yes, Thomas, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I just wanted to first is like, just thank you so much for this presentation. Like, I feel like there's the affirmation that I've needed for like, four semesters being here and um even with like your last slide talking about your son like this is not like related to what I have to say but just like I see myself like I'm 19 and I have like a black mom and a white dad and like just those conversations that you have with your two and a half year old son like my parents just haven't had those conversations or like found difficulties so I just affirm you for that um my question like relates more towards like you know mental wellness how do you sit there and I just practice mental wellness and self-care because like I feel like trying to sit there and undo the social institutions of urban planning for so long like it's not a one person job and just like being also at the intersection of like queerness and blackness like how do you find that time to just sit there and take time to yourself just like de-stress because it's it's hard <laughs> it's extremely hard right and i think that's why that piece around not having to set ourselves on fire to keep other people warm is really important like we we have to start realizing that like you know, we can't call somebody a sellout or say they don't care about the issues if they're not always speaking up because it's exhausting to always speak up. So I think a couple of things. One, we have to figure out who our accomplices are in this work. And when I say accomplice, I'm intentionally not saying ally. I think often folks who aren't members of a press group kind of are on this journey 
and the journey isn't linear. Sometimes you're here, sometimes you're here, sometimes you're here, but oftentimes it's starting off as just being an actor and like faking it until they make it right. Like, I don't know why I should use they, them pronouns, but everybody says I should, so I should. But at some point you have to internalize why you're doing it because if you're just acting, like the jig will be up at some point. And I think when people are done being an actor, that's when they become an ally where they really realize that it's not just the noun, that it's about taking action. And I think that's great. But I think part of what happens with allies is part of the action they often take is they'll pull those, those of us aside who, who are diverse and they'll say, I just want you to know, I know that somebody spoke over you in that class and, and that wasn't cool. I just want you to know I'm happy you're here. They'll send you an email and be like, just checking in. That was intense today, right? And they do all of that because they care and because they're an ally. But the part we're not talking about is they don't do it publicly. They don't do it in the moment when someone's talking over you in class or when something is intense because they see the toll it takes on us to constantly be the one speaking up and calling things out. And because they see how people talk about us when we're not around, like, oh man, here comes Thomas again talking about race, right? And, and we're all human, we wanna be liked. And so sometimes that, that thing you're doing as an ally that seems really great, like we actually need accomplices. We need people who are ready to ride or die, go down with us. Like if we're getting pushed out, you're getting pushed out too. And so the first thing I say to deal with mental health is like, Definitely identify your allies, but really find those accomplices who are going to be ride or die with you. And then I think for folks who are those accomplices, when you are in positions of power, you know, something like doing resume review. Don't look at a woman of color um, resume, you know, a queer person who, who doesn't use um, the pronouns that most people think they should use. Don't look at our resumes and be like, well, they move around a lot. Think about the fact that maybe we're moving around a lot because we're getting pushed out a lot because the mental health toll of being in a place is just so hard. And think about how you can use your power to support us and take a chance on us. And then, you know, the last thing I would say is if you haven't heard about the NAP ministry, um, follow the NAP ministry on different social media channels. It is this Black woman who talks deeply in every day in affirming ways about the way that rest is revolution. Rest is important. And that we don't always have to put ourselves out there to fix other people's problems, right? I once had a therapist, a strong Black woman who said, you may change the world, but that doesn't mean you're going to change that organization. And if in trying to change that organization, you're stunting your momentum for the change you need to make in the world, then move on. We don't have to fix everything to make the big impact we want to make. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I would say is it's really important for us to remember always that no is a complete sentence. We don't owe anybody an explanation. No is a complete sentence. And I think all of those things are really important. Thanks for that comment and question, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Quinn. Sure. Yeah. I, I just really want to also echo that, you know, thank you so much for coming here to speak. I, I've been following your work for a while and I really admire, I really admire you a lot. I'm so happy to, to meet you even virtually. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted, I just wanted to ask one thing that you said that really struck a chord with me, because it's something that I've been ranting about for a long time is the way that planners go to meetings. And I, I've been a transportation planner specifically going to meetings and people ask questions and you can only answer like about things that are transportation and like <laughs> I mean just really putting it together in this way like how do you how do you think about like reorganizing our whole sort of system of of planning and government in a way that you know actually gets people the things that they need when they need it and doesn't make them go to like seven different meetings just to get their questions answered yeah I mean I think I think that's such an important question um Thanks for your kind words, Quinn, and, and for the question. So for me, I think, you know, part of it is like, I remember, like I said, I just, I applied to, to PhD programs at the end of last year. And as I was seeking feedback and, and opinions from folks, even in applying for PhD programs, people were like, you know, one of the struggles you're gonna have is that you're too intersectional. Like you can do that once you get into school, but in your application, try to focus on like, transportation or housing or this or this but try like don't 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 intimidate folks 
don't confuse the potential reader by trying to do too much. And, and I think that, you know, some people said that, but um, someone asked a question, what's, what's happening at, at schools I visited that's exciting to me? I think what's exciting is more places started saying, no, we have to look at things intersectionally, please complicate it. And so I think one of the things that's happening is I think in, at least in some of our academic institutions, we're starting to make that shift. And then I hope as folks start to graduate and go into the profession, um, some of that shift will happen. Um, the other thing is, I think that you know, one of the things we have to do is we have to start using partnership more. And that's something we talked about in, in that NACTO um, paper I shared um, with kind of the dark Navy cover is we talked about the ways that like all partnerships are not created equal. And like the worst is to have no partnerships with community. The, the best is to have partnerships with community, but also having behind the scenes coordination. Because I think too often what happens is once we hear this gripe about, I can only answer one question at a meeting, we're like, we know what we'll do. We'll bring in a community-based organization to help us. But because like you said, departments aren't co coordinating behind the scenes or people working on the projects aren't coordinating um, behind the scenes, um, what will end up happening is that we'll be asking community members to go to 17 different meetings and they're like, why couldn't I just do this? And so I think we have to both partner with community, but also coordinate in the background. And then I think sometimes people underestimate the value of just being human. Some people who are a little scared of equity work think that the right way to do equity work is to say yes to everything a community wants. When I was at the parks organization, we had a big blow up with the community members because they said when this park was being planned, we were told by your staff that we would get to choose where the construction trailer went. And like, this is an eyesore to our neighborhood. And like I said to my staff, why would we ever tell people that they can choose where the construction trailer, like that's not even our choice. Like that's about like fire access and all of these different rules, like that's not about us. And I think sometimes people think doing equity work means saying yes. Doing equity work means being transparent, being honest and being direct. And so sometimes if you're the transportation person and you don't know the answer, just being human is like, you know what? I really don't know the answer to that, but I can totally understand why this is frustrating and why you would come to this meeting expecting that I'd be able to connect you. I know that this community group we're partnering with is also working on evictions. I think they can help you or I know that there's somebody at the city who's working on this. And if you give me your contact information, I will find out who you should reach out to, right? And so we don't always have to have the answer. We just have to be able to validate, acknowledge and be open to connecting people to the resources they need. Wonderful. So, so, Kevin. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, yeah, it really feels like intersectionality is like a fundamental and foundational framework that's like necessary for, for doing work that aligns a, a better impact with uh, good intents and like questioning even like the impact and intent that we want to have. And, um, one thing that I was interested in and wanted to hear more about was sort of like more about like how you view empowering versus co-powering and what it takes to to make sure that the people being impacted by decisions are actually at the table and and actively involved in what happens. Yeah, so, you know, an example I use a lot um, Kevin, is that when, when I was working on Vision Zero, because I think Vision Zero as, as, a, as a paradigm and as a policy initiative is very similar to Slow Streets. It was an initiative that people said, how couldn't this be great? We're saying that we want to get down to zero related deaths and, and serious injuries from traffic. And a lot of folks of color were like, yeah, we're on board with that. But this enforcement piece, we got to talk about it. And instead, what folks heard was you don't support vision zero and we're like no 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 it's not that we don't support vision zero just like you would do in any policy proposal you take it to the people they say i like all of it except for these parts and then you try to negotiate on those parts but there was this thought that people needed to accept something wholesale 
or they were against it. And I think too often that's the framework we have with community. We're like, you're either for this project or you're against it, instead of being open to the fact that, that that's actually an outreach framework. An outreach framework is here's what we're gonna do, what do you think? Engagement is here's what we're gonna do, what do you think? And that's when you get into that back and forth. Well, do you like this part, but why are you doing this part? We're not sure. And so I think working with community, first of all, you have to understand the difference between outreach and engagement and you have to really push yourself to engage in outreach. I think you have to do those things. Um, I talked about with Quinn, which was just, you know, understand that all partnership is not created equal. Um, I think you have to be willing to build those relationships with community before a problem arises. Part of what was so tough about response to the pandemic is there were a bunch of people saying, well, now we wanna help the community, but no one had ever talked to the community. And so something I always used to share is when I was at a bike coalition, I was part of a, a number of collaborative and like community working groups that had nothing to do with bikes, but I was still showing up at every meeting and participating and being active. But that meant when I said something about bikes, people trusted me because I wasn't just coming to them when I needed something, I was building community with them over the long term. And so we have to make sure that we're not just going to folks when we need something. And then that concrete example I was talking about is when we were doing Vision Zero in Los Angeles, there was this intersection and in, in a predominantly uh, Latino community where people kept dying. And so they brought in all of the engineers and all of the planners and they proposed all of these changes to the street and they did them and they did it fairly quickly. And the, the intersection looked great, but people kept dying. And so only after people kept dying, did they go back to the community. And when they went back to the community and they were like, what's going on? What they heard was that on this side of the street, there was a bus stop. And on the other side of the street was a tree. And that tree provided the only shade because as a lot of us know, you can tell a lot about disparities in communities by the sun shades at bus stops. The New York Times did like a whole report about it, right? And in LA in particular, low income communities of color lack shelter. And so people were standing under the tree and there were a lot of older adults in this community. And so they would stand under the tree and they would see the bus coming and they were never gonna walk all the way down to the intersection, wait, cross, and then get the bus. They were still trying to run across the street at the very last minute so they could get shade. And if they had just been talked to first, you probably could have saved a ton of money by just building some shade structures. And so I think that we have to start realizing that the homies who are hanging out on the corner or sitting on their stoop are the grandmother who's peeking through her blinds all day, every day. She knows more about traffic patterns and you know what's happening in the community than we give folks credit for. And I think we have to start engaging with community, but more than anything, paying these folks for the expertise they have. There's no reason that grandmother should make less money than me as a consultant. She knows more than me. And you're frankly just paying me to go talk to her when you could just be paying her. And so I think those are some of the things um, we have to start doing. And when you're doing those things, fundamentally, you're doing them because you're starting from a place of realizing that knowledge and power is already in the community. You're not trying to bring it in you're not trying to overimpose it or empower those folks. You're just like, these folks are powerful. How can I collaborate with them and get some of that power and knowledge out? Years ago, there was a, a planner, uh, Horse Riddle and Mel Weber wrote an article called Dilemmas in a General Theory of Planning. It's back in the 1970s. And one of the things they pointed out is that in wicked problems are something they somewhat cynically called symmetry of ignorance. But what they really meant is exactly what you just said, which is knowledge resides everywhere amongst the people who are pulled together to resolve a problem. We don't know where that knowledge might be, but it could exist in the grandmother, it could exist in you, it's going to exist all over the place. And figuring out how to be sensitive to where that information, that critical information is that's going to help resolve the problem is part of being sensitive to an intersectional situation about being sensitive to community. Um, Kara. 
Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I really resonated to the who forgot portion because my mother is a Cambodian American. And when I feel like I have to explain many times, oh, the US did bomb Cambodia. So when people are like, oh my gosh, that happened. And I can say, I can bet none, no Cambodians have ever forgotten this. Um, so thank you so much. I have a question that's kind of very broad picture. Uh, I'm planning to go do work in Cambodia, unfortunately, uh, in, in infrastructure planning. Most of it ev evicts indigenous populations off of their lands, and indigenous groups that are very underrepresented. it. But unfortunately, it's not like the US right now, where even though there's a lot of change, fortunately, people are listening, and this new administration especially is listening. In Cambodia, there is no one who listening and no one who doesn't who doesn't want to like listen. They're completely going away from this topic. It's very controversial, very political. And also, unfortunately, it's very complicated because Khmer's or the ethnic majority population are indigenous to that land. And so they don't have the same system of oppression that exists in America. So it's harder to bring up this topic coming from a place where, you know, indigenous people have been evicted off of their lands um, long before. So I was wondering what's your take on how do I bring up this topic, knowing that I'm going to be dealing with, you know, people's rights in a place that doesn't even want to listen. Yeah, that's, that's a great um, question. And I, I think you're, you're right. It's so interesting how little um, folks No, not just about Cambodia, but any of, of our colonial like <laughs> practices um, that, that continue to oppress people. And if you don't live in places, um, like here in Long Beach, where we have a huge Cambodian population. It's just stuff that people can go their whole lives and, and never think about. Um, and so, you know, the first thing I would say is this is a question that comes up all the time with my um, foundation clients, especially my foundation clients that are doing climate change work, right? Because part of what happened during the last administration are a lot of foundations were like, well, we don't know what we can do here, but climate change is international. And so we could be investing dollars in all of these other countries. And then you start like pulling out these conversations with folks and they're like, yeah, that you're right. I'm investing a ton of money into this African nation and I've never been there. I, I don't know anything about it. And I'm trying to import our ideas about equity into this country that has a totally different historical and local context. And so, you know, one of the things I always talk to people about is first of all, like, don't stop there. You just have to figure out who's othered, right? And, and, and the reality is when you talk about things like imperialism or colonialism, that is able to unify no matter where you are, right? Or if you're talking about religious um, oppression, right? Like there are some topics that you can talk about um, that, that really, 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 truly can cross barriers. But the process is is the same right like think about how you create that brave space so how do you create a space within the cultural norms and realities where folks can just bravely speak up about what's going on and then i think you still have to do that power like just because um just because i'm black and queer doesn't mean that there aren't situations where i have a ton of power with my stanford law degree and so i think in your specific context you still have to do that power analysis and that power mapping and figure out where the power imbalances are and try to address them through the decisions that you're making and really think about where those privilege disparities are and so that that framework um about brave spaces it's part of um it's part of a longer article that a group of folks put together um, in Salzburg, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation flew a bunch of people uh, to Salzburg, Austria to talk about these things. And that was an international context of folks kind of having the same question as you. When we have these different things than you have in the United States, how do we address it? And so this, this article, and I'll paste the article in the chat, um, talks about how no matter the international setting you're in, what are the types of questions you can ask to get at, at some of, of some of these things you bring up? And hopefully that's helpful. And if not, you can always um, reach out and, and I'm always happy to help. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Ariadne. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, I just wanted to, I really connected with when you said um, empowering communities as a colonial mindset. And I feel like 
most planners come into this profession like with that as like their main thing and I just wanted to know like how do you think we can reckon like our urge to help and empower as planners while even if it's well intended with you know all the consequences that it may have absolutely so I think first is we have to we have to really focus on that intent versus impact piece right like that's so huge and folks have to stop getting caught up in but this is what I wanted to do and isn't that great um and instead be really clear that you know um good intentions don't necessarily get you where you think they're going to get you and and so first I think we have to be able to have honest um conversations about that that you could be a good person trying to do good things but that doesn't mean that that's the impact it's it's gonna have and like I think the other thing we have to help people realize is one of the reasons I think some people like planning and one of the reasons that that some folks get into it is because it feels neutral, right? When you think about planning, you know, regional and city planning, you're not thinking like, well, Republicans feel this way and Democrats feel this way all the time. You're kind of just thinking, right? Like, yeah, there's going to be money for infrastructure. Yeah, housing and, and transit. Like, there are these, these things that are just neutral. And so I think the other thing, if we want to shift this how do we keep folks who, again, are doing this from a good place and are well-meaning from being saviors? I think we have to first start with the fundamental belief and idea um, integrated into all of our work that planning is not neutral, right? Nothing is neutral. You're either perpetuating um, past harms and, and the basis of white supremacy, or you're working actively to change it. And so I think that is something that we just have to hold and we have to say out loud and we have to push people to understand. And if, and, and, you know, the other thing I tell people, and I tell people this unabashedly, like if you're doing this because you just want to help people or save people and you can't be responsive to this idea that this work isn't neutral, well, then I can't really mess with you because we're just on different wavelengths. Right. And, and I think that's, that's the other part of it. We have to realize that we can, we can help people understand and we can provide resources, but if at the end of the day, people can't make that shift, then that might not be the type of planning that you want to do. And there are enough folks, I think, especially now who are seeing things differently that you don't have to do it that way. Thank you. Great. Natana. Yes. Hi, Tamika. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you so eloquently put together all of these pressing issues, you know, um, facing the field today. Um, my question is just centering on this idea of where do you draw the line when you're approaching like community or um, going into community of, you know, preserving culture versus this false um, idea of normal, right? Um, where does that line um, kind of form? Yeah, it's it's tough, right? It's it's a tough line. And I think one of the ways you can address that is that people feel like something is preserving culture or frankly for them if they've been engaged at every step of the process. And so when people say um, when people say, you know, the problem with bike lanes and, and communities of color is that people of color just don't want bike lanes. People of color just don't ride bikes. Um, what I always tell people is people of color have been riding bikes. People of color, you know, whether or not they're immigrants from other countries and that's how they got around or whether or not it's, you know, folks in the hood who, in my opinion, created bike share, right? Like we were the ones who were like, hey, homie, let me borrow your bike for a minute. I'll bring it right back right? Like there was the bike that everybody rode around the neighborhood because only one person had it. And you all did your work and taking care of it because you were going to need to hold the bike at some point, right? And so it's not that these folks don't ride bikes. It's that their question is, why does this matter now? Why are you coming to our neighborhood all of a sudden and saying that now you want people to be safe with a bike lane when we've been riding bikes and you never cared before? And also while you're here, you've been telling us that that lot is going to be a grocery store. Where's the grocery store at? We've been telling you that street light doesn't work. Why can't you fix that, right? And so I think part of walking that line is understanding that for folks to feel a certain way, they need to know that they're included in the process. And so when I worked at the parks organization, if an elected official came to us and said, I have this open lot, can you guys make it a park? 
our mission is to build parks to make sure everybody in LA can be within a 10 minute walk to a park. Most people would be like the answer every time is yes, but that's not how we operated. The way we operated is we got out a map. We drew a radius. We knew that everybody in that radius, we were going to knock on their door business or, you know, uh, a house. We knocked on people's doors. If people said, we don't want to park because we think people are just going to go to the park and use drugs and it's going to be bad for the public health, then we'd have house meetings. We'd bring people together. We'd talk about the health benefits of parks. If people were like, we don't want to park because we need housing, then we would go back to the elected official and be like, we can't build this park. Like people want housing, right? And so it's literally listening to people from the beginning. Once we got over that hump that we were going to build a park, we would bring people out to the lot. We wouldn't just take them to a conference room and show them pictures and give them dots and say, which one do you like best? We would ask them what they wanted. And again, our job when they said we want a roller coaster is to be like, well, we can't really do that. Here's why. This is the actual size. But when they ask other questions, be like, let's see if it can happen. And then every single thing from the color of the playground equipment to making sure that the fencing that went around the park was created and designed by a local artist to the name of the park, to the fact that once the park was open, we hired people in the community who had been part of the planning process to be the people with the keys who opened and closed the park, right? Then nobody's asking you if you're preserving the culture of this community. Instead, everybody's like, oh, this is my park because I've been a part of the park and I am a gang member and I am a grandmother and we both came to those community meetings. So we know that this park is a no-go zone for violence, but this park reflects all of us, right? And so I think if you wanna preserve something, then ask the people who are there, like first don't assume there's no culture. Like when people are like, we're gonna revitalize this area and bring culture back. Don't assume there's no culture there, but then include those folks. Thank you, Tamika. I just, wanted to, um, Four. Shoot, I just wanted to interrupt real quick because um, John Forrester asked a question about 20 minutes ago in the chat. Um, I don't know if he wants to. That was Ants. I think that was Ants. Tamika saw that and answered it. Oh, she did? About. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Shoot. At the schools. Um, so there are four questions left. Technically, we're out of time, but I think everybody, we still have a very large audience. So. Can we go if you're still game to continue for a little bit longer? Sure. Uh, that'll be wonderful. So I'm going to read one question from chat. And then um, I guess Rueda and Peter, um, and I guess one person put their hand down. So um, on the chat, there was a question. Um, Legislation was recently introduced to increase electric vehicle charging infrastructure in low income and BIPOC color communities. Based on all you've shared so far, how do you grapple with the introduction of well-intended ideas like these when, as you've emphasized, a lot of these communities are actively dying from their own zip codes? And as a more open-ended question, how do you see the relationship between personal vehicles and mass transit evolving with EV policy incentives? And where do you see BIPOC communities fitting into that future? That's a small question. Yeah. So I think the first thing I would say is thank you for the question. And this idea, I think, I think in this work, we have to get away from these false dichotomies that something is either good or bad, equitable or not equitable. Um, and, and so, yes, I think sometimes people come in and they want to help people by creating EV infrastructure. Or another good example is, you know, all of a sudden, during the pandemic, all of these city governments that said, we can't do our meetings online. You have to come down to city hall and be able to sit there in the middle of the day. They figured out how to go online. They figured out how to provide more public access and engagement to this space, right? And so then when we say, well, there are certain people still not participating and people say, well, that's because of the digital divide. We're gonna go into low income neighborhoods and create infrastructure and better like Wi-Fi connections. Well. That's great. There is in fact a digital divide and those communities should have better access to Wi-Fi. However, if that's all you do, and then you look back and you say, okay, wait, why aren't they participating in the meetings? But you don't address the time of the meetings. You don't address the fact that these are the folks who are again, the essential workers and have to keep going, who have multiple jobs, who have childcare issues, kind of these deeper issues. 
then yes, you've created Wi-Fi and that's good, but it doesn't solve the problem. And so I think in some of our planning decisions, we have to figure out ways to both like help and do the things that we frankly should have always done. Like having more charging infrastructure in low-income communities is frankly just retrofitting equity and trying to like give people in low-income communities what they always should have had from the beginning. So we should do those things, but we also have to look deeper and realize that they won't solve all of the problems. And as far as electric vehicles generally, I'm not like a, a person who bags on electric vehicles or even autonomous vehicles, right? Like, I think we have to start understanding and, and it seems like this, this current administration is saying all the right things that climate change and, and transportation are intrinsically tied to each other. And that if we're going to attack this climate change problem, we're going to have to, you know, attack GHG emissions from vehicles. Therefore, there need to be more EV, um, you know, vehicles. And we have to make sure that those are accessible to all people. And so I think policy incentives and outreach uh, to BIPOC communities is really important. Again, I just don't think that in doing that, we can think that solves all the problems. I might be able to be better afford an electric vehicle because of an incentive, but if I still am disconnected from the city core and then I have to drive further than my charge allows me to drive, that's a problem if the only affordable housing is that far. If you've set up a congestion pricing program that you charge people by the furthest they are away, but again, as a low income person of color, I now have to live further away because I've been displaced from my community, then who cares about the incentive? So I think we have to do these things, but combine them with being willing to address deep and long lasting um, societal disinvestment in low income communities of color. Rueda. Hi, Tamika. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I had a question regarding how do we include the communities that we're serving? How do we pay the grandmother that knows the traffic of the neighborhood? Because I feel more times than not, there is a barrier that we can't include the communities that we serve. Right. So I think there are two things I would add. I think it's process and will. The, the first thing about process, I think too often when we do any sort of transformational work, not just equity work, but any sort of transformational work, we want the big splashy successes. And I think sometimes that makes the work really hard because we'll, we'll focus on crafting the perfect statement saying Black Lives Matter or putting together the perfect Juneteenth celebration, but that's not actually gonna have as much long-term impact is if some bureaucrat behind the scenes is literally changing the rules and the policies on contracting, right? That's less sexy, that gets less attention, but that's actually to pay community members often in most, in most jurisdictions, the biggest barriers is that we literally just don't have a process, right? We don't have a process to let a community member or even a community-based organization receive payment from a city without providing insurance, having an LLC, being registered as a business. And so I think some of it is doing the boring stuff. And for folks who are like, well, I wanna make change. I wanna be an advocate. I don't know if government's the right job for me. Government is not the right job for me because I talk too much, but I really admire the folks who are in government because Government changes are often very long and painstaking, but the, the impact is like long lasting, right? If you can change that. And so I think we first have to just literally look at the rulemaking and technical policies. That's huge in so many places. The second thing I said was will. And I think the reason having the will and the courage of leaders to enact the change, right? I remember having a conversation with one company who said they wanted to do something for Juneteenth. And I was like, why don't you give people time off? And they were like, because all of our vacation days are in a big bank. Like we don't actually have any days off. You, you can work on Christmas or you can take it off. We just give people 20 vacation days a year, right? And we know a lot of new companies are doing this. And I was like, well then add another day to the vacation bank, give, make it 21 and encourage people to take this particular day off. And the response was, oh, that would be way too expensive. We can't do that. So I think we all, in addition to like changing the policies, we have to realize that doing things differently 
actually means you're gonna have to do things differently. And so we actually need people to have the will and the courage and the fortitude to not just always fall back on, but that's not how we do things. And so you have to be willing to change. And, and the biggest argument for that is when you retrofit equity, it's no different than retrofitting a building. Um, Texas now wants to retrofit their, their grid. That's gonna cost money. Retrofitting is always more expensive than doing it right the first time or listening when people say we should do this in steps over a long process. And so for folks who say they don't wanna do things differently or equitably because it costs too much and takes too much time, you don't get to, you don't get to say you don't wanna do something because it's gonna cost more money or take more time when you were the one who had power to do it differently in the first place. Just do it differently the first time. Great point. Um, one thought I, I have in response to the question of how do you get the grandmother involved is sometimes it's, it, you can find out organizations that grandmother might belong to, like the church or some other organization, and get them involved. It sometimes is easier to set up those relationships to those organizations and then use those organizations to legitimize the input from the people in the community. But what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. And I think we have to figure out ways to not just make participatory research extractive. Like folks also have to feel like they're getting something from it. And sometimes that's, that's money. But I think the other thing we have to realize this piece about not just going to people when we need them, um, you know, there are organizations who might not see, for instance, transportation as one of their core issues. But the problem is we keep saying, how do we get these folks to come to our table? I think one of the most important ways to do this work is realize that our table might not be the right table, right? Like white folks, like they're like, but what if I go to that black barbecue and I'm the only white person? Like, what if I go to that hip hop concert and there's no other people that look like me? That's how black folks feel all the time. Like every, every space we walk into, that's how a person with a disability feels like every time they walk into a room, like we are constantly being like, where are all the black people? Where are, like, like we count, we have it unlocked. And so I think rather than saying, how do we teach people the planning language and bring them to our table? We have to be willing to say, let's go to like, why does it have to be our table? Why does it have to be a table? And so I think that desire also has to be there. Right, right. Peter, the last you get the last question. Hi, um, thank you for speaking today. Um, it seems to me that you know this field asks planners to work within the boundaries given to them, and that lawyers have a relatively unique skill set to challenge that. Has your experience or perspective with law allowed you to better understand how to affect this change, or is it something that you think um, is perhaps not as important? I definitely think my legal background has helped me um, in many ways. I think one of the ways my legal background has helped me is that people are more likely to believe that someone who looks like me is an expert if Stanford Law School said I was smart enough to go there, right? So I think the main way my law degree has helped me is that for the folks who are gatekeepers, I've now gotten a credential that they feel is valid. I don't think uh, and I think it's the same way with like working at a consulting firm, right? Now that I have that private sector experience on, on my resume, I can now ask people for more money than they would have ever paid me to as a executive director of a nonprofit, even though most of the stuff I talk about is what I learned as a, at a nonprofit, not at a private consulting firm. And so I think often the things that help are the things that make those who have historically held power feel more comfortable, honestly. I also think that, that part of what's helped me is that literally my life depends on it. Like I have to be able, right? Like my dad grew up in Omaha, Nebraska in the projects with 14 brothers and sisters standing on the corner selling drugs just to make it, just to help pay for his family. He, in order to be successful, he had to imagine a future for himself that no one gave him the chance of having. He had to imagine a future for his daughters that he didn't even have himself. And so I think part of what helps me think about things that maybe are outside of the lines or outside of the way we usually do things is the fact that in order to survive and live to be the age I am, 
I had to believe in myself and believe that there were possibilities that no one ever showed me, whether or not that's a professor or um, you know, media or a sitcom, whatever it is, like I had to believe there was more for myself. And that's why I think we only do a disservice when we don't have more people from diverse backgrounds and leadership positions, because often those folks are the folks who have had to imagine something for themselves that is wildly different. Thank you so much. Terrific presentation today and great discussion. And we're honored to have you join us. And thank you again for being here. Of course. Thanks for having me. Have a good weekend, folks. Take care.